Okay. The other something that's really kind of close to me, and that's autism. It's something that's very, very important to me. Now, I was going to do this on National Autism Day, which is in April, but I think it's important. There is such a stigma around autism, it is unreal. And the looks he can get when he's out and the prejudice he gets gets on my nerves. It's unreal. Now, autism has this massive stigma in society because they're not like everybody else. And there, there is a range in autism. The autism spectrum is vast. It is. And if we all look rather closely at ourselves, we can all turn around and say we have something that is on there. Now, OCD is a massive part of autism, as is, you know, depression and anxiety is a massive part of the autistic spectrum. Most autistics are depressed and have some form of anxiety. A lot of them are on antidepressants from quite a young age. Um, my son went on antidepressants as a teenager because I didn't want him on him at a really young age. But I know autistics that ended up on antidepressants by the age of 10. It's not a pleasant thing to have to do as a parent, but it is a necessary one. Autistics have issues sleeping. Autism and ADHD is connected very closely. Some children with autism also have ADHD. Some of them also have epilepsy. There are conditions that are closely linked to autism. A lot of children with autism have epilepsy or ADHD. One of the things that scientists have found while researching is that autism can be genetic. It's not completely genetic, but the majority of cases of autism are. Um, it's hereditary. It is actually one of those conditions that's hereditary. You know, regardless of which side of the family it comes from, it's an hereditary condition. Now I know that that, that is the case with my son because his father is Asperger's. Now Asperger's syndrome is still on the autistic spectrum but it's But Asperger's is almost like the most independent part of, of autism that you could possibly imagine. It's the, it's like the gold level of it or the platinum level of it. You know, you can live, you can be independent, you can, you can hold down a job, you, you can, you know, survive in society, you know, you can, you know, <laughs> You understand a lot more about how to be social. You can, you just have this ever decreasing need or ever increasing need to have, you've got the OCD, you've got the obsessive behaviours, you've got a lot more of the other issues. Whereas, I mean, his father, in his work was, I mean, he's highly intelligent. You get all of that. The intelligent levels are off the roof with Asperger's. He was, in his work, he was relentless. I mean, he never stopped working. That was his obsession. His work became his obsession. So did exercising. If he wasn't at work, he was exercising. And when he wasn't doing that, he was socialising. He never took us, he just never stopped. He was always doing something, he had to be busy. Yeah, you know, but that's kind of what they do. They just take on this, they take on the persona of life. Yeah, you know, so they work, 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 work. They, they do this, 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 and whatever they do, they do it till they drop. 
quite literally it's just something they do and they just keep going it becomes this obsession to them so whatever work they do they obsess over it it's constant they're the types of people that will literally die at work they will just like work forever they're the types of people bosses love you know they're the types of people who will over exercise because you know they just don't know when to quit because they love exercising and they just don't know when to quit you know and it's not because they feel the need to like they have like body issues or they have an eating disorder or they have any kind of mental health issue it's just because they've started exercising and now they're obsessed with it they, it becomes an obsession for them they have to do it they don't need to do it you know it becomes an obsession you know and it's the same for everything else in their life they obsess over it um they have to do everything to perfection everything has to be like that you know so if you be if you're diagnosed as asperger's one is the hardest of all of them to actually get a diagnosis for because they are far more sociable they are far more capable of thriving and surviving in society you know but the obsessive behaviours also come with narcissistic personality. I think I've met two or three since he got his diagnosis. Some of them were children, like teenagers. Um, and they were like, yeah, we also got um, MPD as well. They got that diagnosed for MPD as well. So not only did they get an Asperger's diagnosis, but they got tagged with a narcissistic personality disorder as well. But so did his dad. He got the Asperger's and the MPD at exactly the same time. And so did these other people. You know, and their parents were like, how the hell does that happen? But it actually, when I looked it up, they are linked. Because everything they do is an obsession. It has to be perfect at it. You know, but autism... It's not so much about being perfect, it's about just an obsession. They just obsess over things. Some of them have an inability to stay in reality. My son has this thing in his head. He just he struggles to be here in the real world because he feels more comfortable in his own little head you know so he's like he's created his own world inside his head where all his obsessions live and all his like real world kind of stuff live and he's like split it all up into lots of different things and when he feels like it, he just goes off into his own little world he has no real friends he's got one he's got one friend he's nearly 20 he's got one friend you know, most autistics do not have friends. And if they do, they have very, very few. They are loners. Even those that are capable of being slightly independent or independent at all will have very few friends, if any at all. My son is 20, almost, and he has one friend. <laughs> you know, and it's very, very hard for him even to keep in contact with that person. <laughs> he struggles because he has to be sociable with them and he doesn't always know how to be. See, autistics, they, they don't know how to be sociable. They can talk at you, but they can't have a conversation with you. So if you had a niece, nephew, or you have a child, or a friend of yours has a child with autism, you will notice that their development is much slower. So their motor skills, their speech skills, their ability to do things like waving at you, or you know, playing things like pat a cake, things like that, things that they're supposed to do before they're even like two, you'll find that they will not always happen or they'll happen later than they should. 
my son walked at 14 months. He talked at 18, 19 months, he said his first word. Which everything he did was on repeat. I mean, we all know that children do everything on repeat anyway, but with them, it goes into overdrive. So it's not just everything's on repeat, like with most kids. You notice that they take it one step further. So they'll do everything repetitively. So once they're crawling, they'll just do that. That's all they'll do. My son didn't want to crawl, so he refused. He cruised. So he cruised. He would either be carried around or he'd take my hand and pull himself up, walk himself over to a sofa or somewhere he could stand himself up and he would cruise. He hated the feel of the walkers. He didn't like them. He hated them. As hard as I tried, he hated being in a walker, even like the ones where you actually sit in them. He didn't like them. And he didn't like the push along walkers either. Hated them. But if I held his hands, he'll pull himself up and he'd walk over somewhere where he could hold himself up and he'd cruise. But he didn't actually start walking until he was about 14 months. And when he realised that he wasn't doing himself any favours, or I was busy one day, I think he was, what, just over 12 months when he decided he was going to crawl to the sofa and pull himself up because I was, I was too busy to help him. Yeah, <laughs> so he helped himself. Yeah, so I mean, they're not daft. If they don't like doing something, they won't do it. There's this concept of they have a set pattern of behaviour, and they do. When they play, they play the same way, always play the same way. So if they've got blocks, they will play with them all the time. That would be the same thing. And if you try to change the way they play with that block, They'll get, they will freak out. They really will. Um, they will have a set way of doing it. And I mean a set way of doing it. Right down to almost like the colour. I think my son had, I mean even if they can't really tell the colours, they, he almost did it by colour. He found the blocks, just piled them up. But they never seemed to be anything other than darker ones at the bottom and lighter ones at the top so we knew that there were dark colours and light colours you just couldn't figure out what colours they were because they weren't like in order of colour they were dark light you know but and if they were just dark colours or one colour it was even easier you just pile them all up but they were always the same and it was always the same you pile it up until it fell over and then they'd do it again if you tried to change the way he piled them up, he'd get upset and he'd put them back on top. Everything else went in a line. Literally went in a line. And the line was completely straight. I mean, completely straight. I've never seen anything like it in my life. The line was completely straight. And when I took him to the autistic groups, all of them did it. And it didn't matter how old they were, you'd watch them all line things up. And the lines were different as well. Some of them lined things up by size. Some lined them things up by colour, actual colour, like the older ones would line things up by colour and size. Some took things diff like different objects and would line things up, which was kind of amusing. And then they'd upset each other because the lines were wrong and they didn't like it. So they'd undo their people's lines and try to redo it their way. That was funny. 
well, it's funny, it's false I was good saying they were a mess. But <laughs> I know that's rude and that's just wrong, but I found it funny. But <laughs> yeah, watching a bunch of autistics like undo each other's work because they didn't like the way their lines were cut were, were done, you know. <laughs> I mean, it is the ultimate in it. But it's funny as I found it, but you know, you have to be like really professional and kind of like, do you know what? Stop. You have to kind of help them out, don't you? You know, and try to explain to them that you can't do that. That's their line. You've got to make your own. <laughs> but the younger ones, you know, you could kind of separate a load of toys and go, you've got these ones, they've got those ones. But they also have speech issues some of them need speech therapy because they never get their speech through i was lucky his speech came through and not only did it come through by the time he was three um he was speaking he was speaking he was speaking fluently there were a few a group that needed speech therapy because they were much older they were four or five years old some seven no between four and sort of eight that needed speech therapy because their speech wasn't clear enough. It had come in, but it wasn't clear enough. And there were some that could only make like noises. You know, so not all of them, even if they have the ability to walk and use their motor skills and do other things, can't always talk properly and need help. And then there were those that never learned, the, never had the ability to walk you know, so there is this misnomer around and this stigma around autism because it's so diverse. There are so many different things that happen amongst autistics. Those that are independent enough, some let go on to lead amazing lives, independent lives without real help from carers or support. You'll get ones like my son. He has... Now he has what most people, he has an eating disorder. Now I say this because he has sensory issues. Pretty much 99% of all autistics have sensory issues. Okay. And most of them will have a sensory issue with food. Um, if that's the case and they're funny about how they eat and what they eat and why they eat it, it is classed as, as an actual eating disorder. <laughs> He's like that. We have a set routine of what he eats, how he eats it, and why he eats what he eats on set days. Now, I'm not the greatest cook in the world, and since um, my health declined, I can't stand up and do like fresh cooking anymore since I stopped standing up and cooking hours on end when he was like six or seven years old you know so it's been a long time you know but when he was little i used to cook everything from fresh but as i say when you almost die it changes everything and i just don't anymore <laughs> you know i'm far too much medication and far too many bad days to be able to stand there and like do a lot so anyway <laughs> i don't care he eats set meals set days and he likes it that way and he's happy and he's healthy but there are certain things he cannot eat and will not eat because of the smell because of how they look he will only he won't eat things like curries or chilies things like that because they smell they actually smell and he doesn't like it they cannot be in the house because he doesn't like the smell and if he has the smell in the house he will be sick I can have cheese in my house as long as it is completely wrapped up and it's not in the house for long. So I'd be like, I will buy small blocks. He can't touch cheese because he doesn't like the smell and the smell will make him sick. Um, he can't eat dairy. Dairy to autistics is like giving them morphine. Um, so he can have a small amount of yogurt and a small amount of milk every once in a while. Because he likes milk and he likes yogurt, so he can have a small amount every once in a while. But dairy is never a good thing to give an autistic because dairy and autistics does not go. 
because it is like giving them morphine. That's how it affects their brain. It's not good for them. So he's allowed a small amount every once in a while because he actually likes it. It's the only thing he likes. Um, there are certain snacks that he eats that he likes, but they only allowed them in certain ways because otherwise he won't eat them. So, you know, he has issues with food, like the chickens. He only eats certain chicken and he only eats certain fish and he only eats certain bits of potato and they have to be a certain shape and a certain size. Otherwise he won't eat it. You know, so it is classed as an eating disorder because they're sensory issues. He also has an issue with clothes and other things. They have to be super soft. Now, a lot of autistics have sensory issues with a lot of different things. My son has a massive issue with fabric. If it's not soft, he won't wear it. He won't touch it. So all of his clothes are like really soft fabrics. He will not wear it otherwise. Um, he has blankets that are super, super soft. He has everything he has is as soft as I can get it because he has to or he won't touch it. Um, it's not always easy because growing up, you know, trying to get super soft stuff for like kids and everybody else as he grows up has been really difficult. But children and all autistics have sensory issues. All of them do. I've yet to come across one that doesn't have at least a sensory issue of some kind. Um, they all have sleep issues. All of them have sleep issues. They do. They either produce enough melatonin to help them sleep, but will be up at stupid o'clock in the morning. And I mean like me stupid o'clock, like one, two o'clock in the morning. Um, or, like my son, will not produce enough melatonin and not sleep properly. He's on sleeping aids, has been for many years. A lot of the autistic parents that I've met over the years have also had their kids on sleeping aids for a long time because they don't sleep either. They just do not produce enough melatonin if they produce any at all. He sleeps. If he manages to sleep at all overnight, even on sleeping, sleeping aids, it's a miracle. Um, and then he'll nap throughout the day. Even at uni, he'll do this. Right? He did it at college, did it at school. He will have micro naps throughout the day. A lot of autistics do this as well. They will have naps. <laughs> it's weird, but they do, they nap at set times. He has a tendency to nap. When he was at college, he napped when he got home and if he was if it was a day off he would nap like he is now between half nine and about 11 o'clock and then he'll have if he was at college he would nap like he did at school between four and six in the evening that's what he does he naps um and he'll start doing that once he hits uni in September, he will nap at roughly the same kind of times, depending on what days he's in and what he's doing and what his schedule's like. But he will take those naps around the same kind of times. There will be autistics that will need care and support their entire lives. They will never get a job. They will never be able to hold down a job. And, you know, no matter how hard people try, it will be harder and harder and harder for them to survive in society. Then there will be people like my son, who is independent enough 
to be able to go out into the world as long as he has the care and support in place he will never leave home i'm absolutely convinced of that um which is fine um when the time comes he will end up in an independent living situation where he will have again carers and support in place at all times you know so that he doesn't have to deal with shit because he can't he has an issue dealing with money for a start he has money of his own he knows how to do what you know he knows about it he knows how to handle it he knows what to do with it but the concept of actually living in the world and dealing with everyday you know stuff he panics and can't handle it and falls apart and goes and rocks himself and he does he will rock himself autistics have a way of coping he will walk himself around in circles and he will rock a lot of autistics will do this they will rock they will walk around in circles they will use their bodies as a way to kind of express themselves and each one will have a way of doing things and when they're young as they're sort of coming up sort of two three years old you will see how they're how they're going to do this you will watch it he has always from the age of since he was two walked around in circles that is how he deals when something panics him when he's freaking out he will go round and round and round in circles for hours until you calm him down and then he'll rock back and forth until his brain completely calms down a lot of autistics are like this and some have different ways of showing how stressed out they are and some have different ways of expressing that but a lot of them will rock and a lot of them will curl up um they usually have some kind of comforter um, a lot of them in fact the majority of them will have a comforter of some kind to help them calm down he has his teddies um or he'll hold a piece of cloth which is super super soft and he'll hold on to that and he'll stroke it yeah you know, that is how he deals with things that are struggling and he's helping and he can't cope and he needs to calm down that is how he copes that is how he calms his brain he'll either cuddle a teddy if he's at home or if he's outside he's got a piece of cloth really nice and soft that he will stroke and he will hold and he will rock until his brain kind of calms down and then he's fine autistics need comfort when they are stressing out because their brain takes over and they don't know what to do with it so they have to have a coping mechanism which is why the support comes in and the caring carers come in they know how to force them into seeking comfort and to stopping whatever it is they're freaking out about and to force them into calm mode um it takes a while because when they're really going for it there are those that will scream and shout and yell and whatever and freak out in public when that happens people look at them like they're crazy like there's something really wrong with them and they will make everybody else feel really uncomfortable because people will treat them like they're crazy and instead of trying to help they'll make either the parents or their carers feel really guilty instead of trying to be understanding and it's awful and it shouldn't happen but it does now i know this feel is much longer than it should be but it is important that people understand that autism isn't this awful detrimental crazy evil thing 
and that when you see somebody freaking out in public with their parents or with some carer you shouldn't be judging them you shouldn't be treating them like there's something seriously wrong with them or looking at that parent like there's something wrong with that parent that they should be making that child behave like that or they shouldn't be disciplining that child because they're behaving like that we can stop that behavior but it takes time we have to calm their brains down we have to <sighs> there's a routine we have to do there are some ways to help them but it takes more than two seconds we can't just yell scream and shout because shouting at an autistic makes it worse yelling and shouting hurts their ears and will make them scream louder and it will make their behavior more erratic and it doesn't help anybody and when we're feeling guilty because our children are behaving like that all we want to do is scream at them to stop behaving like that all we want to do is get out of where we're going and try to try to hide because we feel bad that everybody's having to deal with their behavior because everyone's judging us for having bad children when in reality that child is having a massive attack and if they gave us a few minutes we can calm that kid down and everything will be fine you just have to stop talking to the parents and treating the kid like it's evil and like it's really bad and like we're bad parents it's not nice it's a horrible feeling and we feel guilty enough as it is because our kid is having a meltdown in the middle of town or in the middle of somewhere or wherever we are you know and we feel bad enough as it is you know it's not nice and i tell you one thing for nothing he's an adult legally an adult and when he has a freak out on his own and people judge him for it he comes home and a mess i get a phone call and he's miserable and doesn't understand why people were upset with him you know and at the same time he doesn't really understand why he's feeling so hurt because it's not his fault he didn't doesn't understand what he did wrong and at the end of the day he didn't do anything wrong you know he's just being himself and when he explains the situation i'm like well you didn't do anything wrong you're okay they're just being judgmental and then he gets more upset and doesn't understand that either because autistics have no concept of feelings emotions they can't read social situations when they can't read social situations and they can't read people's emotions and feelings they hurt people really easily they can upset other people really easily and they can misread a lot of things so easily and he does it a lot you know he is capable of doing almost anything but he cannot read social situations he cannot read feelings he cannot read emotions he can read your tone of voice and you'll find that a lot of autistics do this it's like talking to a it's a ridiculous thing to have to say but it's like talking to a dog or you know your tone of voice is important you know or a child even you get down on their level and you talk to them you know properly you check your tone of voice and you make sure that the way you're speaking reflects how you're how you think about them not how you're feeling inside you say hi in the wrong so tone of voice he thinks he's done something completely evil he thinks he's the worst person on the planet you know when in reality you're just in a bad mood because you you know for whatever reason but he thinks he's evil and he's done something awful to you <laughs> you know and doesn't understand he takes everything literally all autistics do that 
they take everything literally they do not understand social cues and they do not understand emotions and feelings they can't read you they think that reading people is reading how they speak they think reading social cues is reading how people are talking they don't understand that it's not the same and even if they learn their own emotions and feelings they'll never learn yours it's so important that we stop judging autistics and people with ADHD I'm going to do that one next I am going to do a whole thing on ADHD I'm going to look it all up I'm going to figure it all out because it's not fair and it's not right I I am about to do a whole fucking series on mental health for my members because I think it's important but the way that autistics and thing and people with ADHD and that they are treated in society is awful and hate it my niece is ADHD she's just been diagnosed and I've seen so many and I hate the way my son is treated and I'm you know being part of a community where I'm in contact with other parents of autistics and I know how they're treated as well and to be on the receiving end of the judgment that autistics get and the judgment that us parents get as well is awful and it's not gotten any better over the years I mean I hoped that over the years I mean he's almost 20 and it's gotten no better in fact the stigma has gotten worse for autistics not better the judgment the understanding it hasn't gotten any easier for them you know and it's such a shock to see how how little it's progressed over the years when in reality their behaviours, the research and the information that is out there for people with autism and for those that want to look it up is immense. There is so much out there. And yet, as far as society is concerned, they've already condemned them. You know, and it just really annoys me. I know that National Autistic Day is the 2nd of April. There are several different signs and symbols for that, which I will do on National Autism Day. I will talk about those on National Autism Day because they're kind of cool. You know, but I do think this is necessary. So when you see people see parents of kids who are behaving erratically outside do not just assume that they're bad kids they're naughty you know don't just judge them as bad parents who can't control their children when you have no idea what they're dealing with they could have a kid who is autistic or adhd or add who's just having a meltdown and if you give them a bit of time five ten minutes that kid will calm down and everything will be fine but the more you judge the more you yell at them the more you tell them to sort their kid out the harder it will be for them to deal with it because as long as they are being judged they are stressed and stress does not help them calm their kid down because they can hear it they can hear the stress and the condemnation and the judgment in their tone of voice and they need to be able to put it all aside to be able to handle their kid and they feel guilty enough as it is and embarrassed enough as it is you know 
it's hard enough for us parents of autistic ADHD and ADD kids when they're having a meltdown in public and it's made worse by everybody else and when we're trying to calm them down we need to be able to put it all away and stay calm so when you see it you see the behaviors do not automatically assume bad kid bad parent and do not whatever you do voice those kind of thoughts because they don't help the situation at all they really don't anyway this video is really long and i'll probably repeat myself 50 million times but i'm gonna go because yeah i'm really cold now